tiny, little, miniature, small, microscopic. What types of thoughts and feelings did that provoke? Minor, limited, trivial, inconsequential. I want to tell you about why the small are anything but that. I'm a phytoplankton ecologist. Yeah, I can see the question marks above your heads. <laughs> I study the microscopic organisms within our aquatic food webs. Through photosynthesis, they take in light, carbon dioxide, and water, and produce sugars and roughly half of the oxygen on this planet. There are over 5,000 known species of phytoplankton, and they come in some of the most unique shapes that help them avoid predation, stay in the sunlight, and gather nutrients. Oh, and by the way, yes, they can swim. They are the base of our aquatic food webs, transferring energy up to higher organisms. I want to take you on a journey into the world of the small to give you a glimpse at how they impact our lives, but also how we impact theirs. Blooms of hundreds to millions of cells can be picked up by satellite imaging, giving us a glimpse at how physical currents move them in mass across the planet. It also gives us an idea of how they're impacted by their environment. Phytoplankton are influenced by their environment. That's to say, they are impacted by the world around them. Let's take light, for example. Light can vary seasonally, or can be based off of the turbidity or cloudiness of the water. Non-living turbidity comes mainly in the form of sediments that have been washed down from the surrounding landscape. Oftentimes, with those sediments comes nutrients, molecules such as nitrogen, phosphorus, silica, or iron that phytoplankton, just like us, use for growth. As nutrients increase in our aquatic waterways, Phytoplankton are able to grow and increase in abundance. This is a balancing act. Nutrient concentrations need to be just enough for phytoplankton to grow and flourish and their predators to consume them, moving energy up the food web. As an ecologist, I would note that this is a healthy ecosystem that has maintained its structure and function. It's when this system becomes unbalanced that the connections with inside can start to break down and they can have rippling effects. We all know the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Like Dr. Jekyll, the community of phytoplankton in most ecosystems are essential to the health of the ecosystem. But there are just a few that can turn into Mr. Hyde. I study that specific subset that are harmful to ecosystems known as harmful algal blooms, or HABs. You might have heard them called red tides in the past. HABs come from a variety of biological groups, including cyanobacteria, diatoms, and dinoflagellates. All of them are impacted by their environment and all have a different detrimental effect to the ecosystem. For example, some create blooms so large that they shade out important habitats. Others produce a secret weapon, a set of chemicals that are harmful to ecosystem and human health. HABs are abundant in our coastal and freshwater ecosystems worldwide, affecting virtually every coastline. Depending on where you're at in the United States, you could be impacted by a specific HAB species. For example, we know that the Great Lakes suffer from microcystis blooms, a cyanobacteria which has the potential to create a hepatoxin, which is destructive to the liver systems of higher organisms and is also a potential carcinogen. Humans are most directly exposed to this phycotoxin through our drinking water. As the events of Toledo, Ohio showed us in 2014, where phycotoxin levels reached unsafe conditions and water services were shut down for 450,000 people for three days. The diatom Pseudonychia occurs along several of our coastlines, 
but most notably along the western coast of the United States. Pseudonychia creates a neurotoxin known as domoic acid, which can lead to acute and chronic toxicity in both marine mammals and humans. It does this by mimicking the essential neuron transmitter, glutamate, causing our nerves to fire. Ultimate consequence? Cells die. When we consume shellfish that have eaten toxic pseudonychia, we suffer from amnesic shellfish poisoning. Symptoms include gastrointestinal distress, seizures, short-term memory loss, and in severe cases, has led to death. If these guys weren't bad enough for you, let me tell you about Karenia brevis, whose bloom in the eastern Gulf of Mexico just ended after a year and a half. Karenia brevis occurs quite frequently in the Gulf of Mexico, occurring often yearly off the west coast of Florida and with less regularity in the remaining Gulf states. The last bloom to occur in Louisiana happened in 2015 and 16, where the shellfish fisheries were closed east of the Mississippi River for two months. Karenia brevis, a dinoflagellate, creates multiple neurotoxins that bind to vulture-sensitive sodium channels within our cells. Once bound, it does not allow these channels to close, causing some continuous signals. We can be exposed to this phycotoxin through consumption of shellfish or just through breathing. As blooms of Karenia brevis move on shore, the cells break open allowing us to breathe in the toxins, causing our eyes to water, we'll start to cough, and our lung capacity to decrease. Essentially, our eyes and lungs are spasming. And you don't need to be present on the beach to feel these effects. These aerosolized toxins can reach up to a mile inland. I can continue to tell you about hab species, but the important takeaway is that we are all members of this food web, starting with the phytoplankton, moving up through fish and shellfish, and ending potentially with humans. The small have a big impact on our drinking water, our seafood industry, and ecosystem and human health. For the majority of seafood that have consumed these toxins, cooking and freezing does not destroy the toxin and in some of these cases, actually makes the toxins more toxic. We are fortunate that here in the United States, local, state, and federal governments monitor for these phycotoxins and are able to warn water managers and close shellfish fisheries when they reach dangerous levels. So our potential exposure to these toxins is greatly reduced. This is not necessarily the case around the world. Over the last several years, as a researcher at the School of Renewable Natural Resources in Louisiana, at Louisiana State University, I've been studying the presence of domoic acid and pseudonychia in the waters off Mozambique, where there is currently no monitoring for amnesic shellfish poisoning, and with symptoms similar to malaria, is likely not diagnosed or even considered. It is estimated that fish, crustaceans, and mollusks represent 17% of the protein consumed worldwide. This is a food source we eat across the planet, regardless of socioeconomic boundary and developmental status. The study and understanding of HAP species is more than just cu scientific curiosity. It is about food and water security and ecosystem and human health. We are finding that HABs are increasing in frequency and duration worldwide. This is likely due to us being more aware of their presence, but also due to an array of anthropogenic impacts, including climate change. This leads us to our next question. Why are HABs producing these toxins? That is a big and complicated question that we are still exploring for a number of these species. What we do know is that for the majority of these species, growth and at times toxin production is influenced by environmental factors such as nutrients, light, predation, and competition with other phytoplankton. These environmental factors are influenced by changes in the landscape. According to the United Nations, 
40% of the world's population lives within 60 miles of the coast. With this occupancy, we have changed the structure and function of our natural coastal systems. We are finding that nutrients, herbicides, and pesticides are increasing in our waterways from development and agriculture and aquacultural production. We are often removing natural structures such as wetlands and replacing them with canals and seawalls that lead towards greater nutrients and freshwater impulses into these systems. This is happening in developed and developing countries alike. Simply put, human manipulation of these ecosystems is leading to a decline in the structure and function of our natural coastal plains. I've taken this time to introduce you to the bad guy in our aquatic ecosystems. But this bad guy is an essential member of the phytoplankton community, who oftentimes is just taking advantage of a system that has become unbalanced. As I mentioned before, there are connections throughout our ecosystems that are essential to the health of the ecosystem. And when these break down, they can have rippling effects. Similar to the Stevenson story, Mr. Hyde is just responding to what Dr. Jekyll has given him. We have to acknowledge the impact of the small, not just the microscopic organisms that are toxic to human and ecosystem health, because it's not just that one phytoplankton cell that's causing the issue. It is blooms of hundreds to millions of cells. The same can be said about the occupancy of people within our coastal areas. Development will continue. Our population will grow. But we can be smarter at how we progress. We can acknowledge the delicate balance within our ecosystems by embracing conservation, sustainable development, and ecosystem-based management. We can choose that structure and function are important. Just like HABs, our collective small actions can have a big, powerful effect within the world we share. Thank you. <laughs>